Well, good morning. Appreciate you being here today. <clears throat> if you are visiting with us, we're really happy that you're here. If you're online with us, uh, we're glad that you're paying attention to the things of the Lord. We hope things will be better for you soon that you can be with us. <clears throat> really happy to have the Gallaghers with us today. Gallaghers go back uh, in my lifetime, <clears throat> back to when I was 22 years old, 21, 22, and and uh, studying to preach in Denver, and uh, they were a great encouragement to me. And it's, you know, I appreciate uh, lifetime saints. You know, we come to Christ at any time. And, and we had a friend who was a Christian three, three to four weeks recently and died, and we're grateful for that. And but our, we're also grateful for people who have just served the Lord all their lives. And the Gallaghers have been those bulwarks of faith through the years. And I appreciate what they are to me and the encouragement they were to me back uh, back in those old days. They were not necessarily better days as much as we might want to paint them, um, but they were the old days no matter what. So <laughs> it is. I appreciate uh, appreciate their faith and uh, hopefully you, you can get to know them. So we're looking at today at the idea of some things regarding regarding mom, but really more about responsibility with kids. But before we get there, let's let's remember this is our memory verse today, Psalm 119, 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. <clears throat> I'm trying to make it so that it's, it's my life, my day, that I am praising God seven times a day. I, I try to remember on even, even clock numbers to, uh, to give God praise because, I, you know, I thought maybe I should Praise God seven times a day. Uh, maybe this is something I should take literal, but, you know, we realize that uh, no matter how you look at the number seven, is it completion or was it uh, the idea of a, of a perfection? It's the idea of a heart that is attuned to God and giving God praise, giving God praise. And that's what life is for us, is giving God praise. And I would encourage all of us to just let that be something several times a day. You praise your God. You talk to your God, of course, about many things, but you give him the praise that is due to him. So we realize, of course, that disciples, uh, you know, we're trying to do the job of, of raising people for God. And some of us get a little older and we're trying to do that for our kids. And some are younger and they're trying to learn. And we have this message given to us for those that are younger, for children, that they need to, to give honor to mom and dad. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, and that's the first commandment with promise. Things are going to go well with you. And it's the idea that you know, no matter who your mom and dad might be, no matter how old you, ought, you might be, you, you really ought to be people that are appreciative of mom and dad, thankful to mom and dad. Even if mom and dad didn't do everything you know that mom and dad could have done, there's always something for which you should be thankful to your mother and your father. If nothing else, they brought you into the world. Here you are. You exist. Thank you to a mother and a father that I exist. But for all of the other many, many, many things that go to make up who you are, you really, really should be grateful. But that's not what we're talking about today. Really what I wanted to talk about is the idea of trying to understand the magnitude of raising children. And I think every, every parent should learn this from really before they have children, that this is something that they should be raised with, understanding how they're going to raise their children. It should be operating within all of us. Um, it's, it should be a pattern that just goes from generation to generation. Do we really understand the magnitude of raising children? You know, when the Wright brothers were experimenting with flying back in the early 1900s, uh, they, they had to go through a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of different experiments. And they finally got to where they could fly for a few seconds. And finally, they could fly for a minute. And it was really, it's an amazing thing. But could they have really, at that point, understood the magnitude of what they were doing? Could they have understood what was going to happen even you know, 15 years on? onward in World War I? Could they have understood, you know, the battles that would take, the aerial battles that would take place? Could they have understood the jet age? 
Could they have understood the rocketry that would come from that? Could they have understood, could they have comprehended that someday man is going to go to the moon, man will walk on the moon, and man will return to earth? Could they comprehend that there are things that would be orbiting around the earth? I, I, I think they probably did not think about those things. <laughs> I think they probably were just really interested in trying to figure out how to, how to stay in the air. They didn't, though, really have, they couldn't have the magnitude of what they were doing in their, in their mind, but the magnitude was there. There were great repercussions, and really the same thing is true about raising a child. If only we can understand the great magnitude of what we are doing, because I believe too many parents, they just underemphasize what they're doing. They're, they're not aware just how great and how big this thing really is, and so the job that they do is minuscule, or the job they do is very, very minimal, and the job they do might be something that's actually destructive to a child. So let's talk about some things that every parent really should understand. You know, when you hold that little baby in your arms, it's a brand new baby. I remember that still. I remember holding Lisa in my arms. And uh, I'll never forget it. I just the, the preciousness of, of that little child and what that child was bringing that child home, home and, and putting that little, little child's hand in my hand and just, just feeling that child's hand. You know, it, it was such a, such a beautiful thing. We, we hold our children in our, in our arms, but this sermon's really not just for the little baby you hold in your arms. It's for the, it's for the teenager even that you might hold in your arms. It's, for, it's understanding really regarding all of our kids, no matter what how old they might be. But do we really understand what's going on with this child that is in our arms? You see, because this is really, really a very, very huge thing that is going on. That little child that you hold in your arms is a God-created thing. We're familiar with Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 that ultimately the dust will return. Somebody dies, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who what? God who gave it. God gave the Spirit. That little child, you know, when you hold that little child in your arms, you're looking at a God-created, God-designed unit. And it's true that two people could have come together in the night and reproduced and totally not get this picture, but the truth is here, no matter how this child came to be, this is a child who now has creation of God all over it. This child has a spirit that was created by God, a soul that's created by God. This, this child has a body that in, in all the, the function of its cellular uh, level and its DNA is coming to be and to, and to live, to function in this earth. This is all a God-designed thing. And we try to get this picture now of, of a child that I'm holding in my arms and I'm sitting there in wonder, but there's so much more to wonder about than we can possibly comprehend. God created this thing. This is a mighty soul. God created this thing. And God created this one as an eternal soul. You sit there and you're contemplating your little child this child's going to live forever. Jesus taught us in Matthew 25, verse 46, that some will go to everlasting punishment and the righteous will go into eternal life. And we have the idea of an eternity that is given to this little child. And so here we are, we're looking at this little child and the implications are, are so huge for this little child. And here I am, I'm a dad trying to raise this in the training and admonition of the Lord. And here is a mom that is you know, trying to raise a, raise a child to, to, so that they'll love their child, so that they'll be chaste and, and they'll be homemakers and obedient to their husbands and that they'll follow God. And, but when you stop and consider just the magnitude of this, the sheer magnitude of the, the little child that you hold in your, your arms, God created God designed this. This child will be living, will be existed, eons existing, eons and eons from now. 
And that takes then child rearing above, you know, won't it be fun if we as mom and dad have a little child kind of like us, you know? Or it's what married people are supposed to do, have kids. Or, or parents who say, you know, I'll really enjoy vicariously, you know, enjoying life by, by what my child experiences. Or looking at a little child and saying, you know, what wonderful pleasures are going to come out from our relationship with each other through the year? You know, some of these things might be true. But how we don't get the big picture, the huge picture of what this child really is, a God-created being who is going to live forever, that's what every parent should begin to embrace about this little child. It's what every parent should embrace when they look at their, their six-year-old, their 10-year-old, their 14-year-old. Because suddenly that changes everything, doesn't it? Remember we talk about things you cannot leave static? There's a bomb under your seat. You don't leave that static like it just sits there and you don't do anything. There is a God. That's not a static statement. Your child is created by God as eternal being. Those are not static statements. They have strong implications. The very idea of these concepts existing, that, that these things are true, demands that a parent then go in a certain direction in their child's life. If only every parent could begin to embrace, and here's the encouragement for everyone here to do that, to embrace this little child, not as just the little extension of my nuclear family, but as that which has been produced from God and will live forever. This is something of tremendous magnitude. And so here I am, I'm thinking about how how wondrous my child is and the magnitude of all of this and how this child is so much bigger than the mere existence of this earth. And I think, you know, maybe I need to construct this child properly. Maybe the magnitude of this circumstance is such that I need to respond and do the right thing for my child. What should be the right thing? How should I construct my child? What an awesome project that is. Once we understand the magnitude of, of what, what we're doing, we begin to take a step back and say, wow, I really, really have a big, important job in front of me. Lord, may I ever remember the magnitude of this circumstance, and may it ever drive me in the right way to construct this child to be what it needs to be. And so there are huge principles to instill in, in your child. And we want to look at some of these basic, just very important principles that if they're built within one, it really will determine what happens in life for this child. The first one is, who am I? Humans have been asking that question for a long time, right? Who am I? In the great construction project of raising a child, there's, there's something you can teach a child from his very beginning, who he is. Because to tell the truth, out here in this world, they're going to hear all kinds of garbage regarding that. And in the final analysis, people are kind of sitting there wondering, I don't know who I am, except I get to serve myself uh, for the rest of my life, and I'll do whatever I want to do, and don't bother me about it. How sad for those who have been raised with this kind of a mentality, not knowing who they are. But God, of course, has given an identity to all humans. And we have looked at this before. We will never get away from it. It's what older people need to be going back to. It's what a younger person should be trained to, to realize. Who am I? I am a God-created being. God created man in his own image, one, chapter, chapter uh, 1 of Genesis and verse 27. God created man in his own image. I'm a God-designed and God-created being. And that goes into everything that I do. I am one that God has wanted to be with. Remember in, in Genesis 3, this illustrates really all of the, of the Scripture, that God came down to the cool of the garden. God, you know, the great we, immense God we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the great immense God has made Adam and Eve, and he's come down in the cool of the garden. And we've mentioned before that was not because it was a hot day in heaven and he had to have a break. 
it was all about coming down and be with his little creation that he loved. God wanted to be with Adam and Eve that he loved and that he wanted them to, to love him back. And we begin to get this process down that God desires relationship. Who am I? I'm created by God, designed by God, designed for relationship with God. God wants a relationship with me. I'm designed to live forever with God. We, have, we come to, to see this whole picture throughout the Bible, throughout the, the full scriptures, that I, I'm created by God. I'm loved by God. I'm designed to love God, and I'm designed to live with God in eternal relationship. Now, if you ask, you know, someone in, at Princeton or Dartmouth in a philosophy class, you know, who am I? You're going to get all kinds of different answers. But actually, here's the true answer. Who am I? This is what every child should know. I know who I am. And once you know who you are, you don't have to fiddle around with how you fit in with everybody else. You're not looking for your identity to be defined by another person or by another group of people. You're not trying to accomplish this or that task so you can now join an identification with this group of people that appreciates and respects that. God tells me who I am. This is who I am. Once I know who I am, it frees me then in what I do in my life. Not to be under the judgment of others. Those things don't matter. But to be free to be what God wants me to be, to serve Him. Others might not like it. They might even kill me for it. But that's what I'm all about. This is who God designed us to be. And there's something very beautiful and very freeing in this. There's something very clear to the need of the human. People are trying to discover, who am I? You know, I'm on the journey to discover what I am and who I am. And that's usually, that usually means, you know, some function, I'm going to do this, and I find purpose in it, or some education, I, and that means a lot to me. And a lot of people can't answer the question, who am I? You know what? Every three-year-old should be able to answer that. Here's a challenge. Train your little kids this week so if you ask them who they are, they will say, I'm created by God and loved by God to love God and live forever with Him. That's who I am, Mommy. Let every 12-year-old answer the question just like that because this is the ultimate reality. Who am I? The second great question that we have to plant in our, our child and, and an answer to this is what is truth? This is huge. What is truth? Because we live in a time when there is no truth, right? That's what's being taught. There really is no truth. Everything is, is relative. There are no absolutes. If you take you know, any kind of uh, uh, humanities class or ethics class or basic philosophy, you're going to get this idea that, that there are no absolutes. This is what many are going to throw out there. And there's nothing that, that's absolute. You know, there's, truth is always a relative thing. In fact, truth is kind of depends on where you stand, and it's all changeable. And, you know, it kind of relates over here, and it relates in different, peop in different ways to, to different people. And, and this is kind of where, where we, we go. This is kind of what we hear, that there's really no absolute. There's no right and wrong. And, of course, that's true absolutely, right? You know, we the old argument, uh, there are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure about that? Yes, I am. There are no absolutes. I know that's not quite logical there, is it? But anyway, really you come back to this as far as today's teachings are concerned, that there are no absolutes. And, you know, Marxism went this direction, that it's really about how powerful you are. And really it's, you know, survival is going to be to those that are, are the most powerful and can make it happen. If you want to get to the basic philosophy, you can strip all the want to's of humanity and all the shoulds that you should, should be doing in humanity. You come down to this. This is the great philosophy. If there's no God, the most powerful will win. And I, I will want my way over you. And if I have more bigger muscles than you and bigger teeth, 
then I will have my way. And that's, that's kind of the bottom line of where things are in this, this world. Many people would disagree with this and go different directions, of course. But, hey, if we all get to choose our own reality anyway, and we all get to kind of choose truth for me, hey, this one works for me, right? See what I'm saying? But actually, we realize that absolutes do live here. Absolutes live on Earth. If you're orbiting outside of your shuttle, the space shuttle around the Earth, and you jump out of your spacesuit, we know absolutely what's going to happen. Absolutely, you're going to, yeah, there are all kinds of absolutes. As uh, Rabbi Zacharias used to say in, in his home of India, Everybody knows that if you lay down in front of the bus, it's going to run over you and it will kill you. He says, that's an absolute. There's the story about the elephant. Uh, it's, a, it's an old Indian fable. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, it's, it's all over philosophy and it's been in all kinds of sermons. But in the 1800s, there was actually a poem that was uh, put together regarding this and of six blind men that looked at an elephant. They wanted to discover more about the elephant, and so they all went to the elephant, Never had never been in contact with one, so they could get an idea of what the elephant was. So they're all in different areas of the elephant trying to form their opinion of the elephant. The poem goes like this. It was six men of Indostan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each my observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very much like a wall. The second feeling of the text, Tusk, cried, Ho, oh, what have we here so very round and smooth and sharp? To me, it is mighty clear this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant it's very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt above the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. He sh I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each party was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. Now, this is, this is quoted for different purposes sometimes, but one of them is to say, now, here's the great big old view of an elephant. Who is anyone to think they can view all of truth and grasp it all when all they can see is this little part? One man saw the rope, and for him, that was what the elephant was. It was it, he saw the tail, and, and it's a rope. And for, for the other, he saw the, the tusk, and, and it was a spear. And that's all his mind could grasp. And uh, that, was, that was the interpretation of his reality. And who are you who are you to judge others in their interpretation of, of reality, right? You're looking uh, at the tail, uh, but others just, hey, their experiences are different, and you, you really should respect everybody else's view. Now, the other usage of this is that it doesn't matter what everybody thought the elephant was. It didn't matter if he thought it was a rope. It didn't matter if he thought it was a spear. It didn't matter if he thought it was a fan or a wall, because actually, what was there? What was it? It was an elephant. And that's the point. That's the great reality. The reality is that that's an elephant. And man might have all kinds of interpretations regarding what this, what this elephant is, but, but that doesn't make everybody right. And his little faulty experiential experience with the elephant, that, that's not enough to, to come to conclusions regarding what the elephant is. How about sitting back and getting the big picture, putting it all together? How about coming to reality? There is a great reality, and there is an absolute in this, in this scenario. And there are absolutes that we have to believe in. 
Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. There is a creator. Ecclesiastes 12.13, fear God and keep his commandments. We have a creator in Ecclesiastes 12, and we have the role that we have under the creator. Ecclesiastes 12 is very much a picture of our great reality on earth that most humans don't get. So we have this this great reality that we as parents should be teaching our children. They're, they are eternal beings. God is the creator. And that as humans, that our role, the human role, is to line up with God the creator. What else would you do? The great immense God is your designer and your creator. What is our role? Son, your role is not just to go get the best job you could get. Son, your, your job is not just to go and and have, you know, find self-actualization. Your job is not just to go and take your education as far as you can go. And son, what is your life about? Your life is about fear God and keep his commandments. Because God is your creator. And this is the great reality. And this is the great truth. And this is an absolute truth. And every child should be raised with this. Then there's the idea of what will I contribute to this world? Because, you know, a lot of parents, I think they miss the point. Well, I want you to to be raised with a green mentality so that you will take care of our earth and nurture our earth, okay? Uh, You know, I want you you to be able to to grow up and to contribute good things from, from a great education, and, and I want you to learn counseling, and I want you to be able to help people, okay? But there's a bigger scale to all these things. We want our children to do, to do, you know, to have good lives. We want to try to prop those things for them, like education, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't want to forget the biggest picture. What will I contribute? Every child should be raised with what he's going to contribute to the world. And he can either contribute darkness and wickedness and selfishness to the world. All you have to do is not even talk to your child and they'll, they'll do this kind of naturally. Or a child can understand the idea of being the light of God and the light of all of good, that which is good and godly, and that this is where my life will go. You know what every parent needs to do? Every parent needs to teach their child about being a son or daughter of light, Ephesians 5. And to make sure they understand what their role is as they're growing up. Your role is not just to go as far as you can in education. That's tiny compared to the big picture of what this child is. It's a creation of God designed by God to be something under God. What is this child designed to be? It's designed to be light. Every child should know, should be being raised by mom and dad to be contributors to light, contributors to godliness. Here's what your life will be. You're going to stop thinking about yourself all the time. You're going to, uh, you're going to begin to to think about others and you're going to have some self-sacrifice and self-control as you put the needs of others above your own life. And you're going to think about what's good for others. And you're going to think about the things of God with others. And you're going to live these things in your life. And that's what every three-year-old should know. That's what every 12-year-old should know. And to tell you the truth, many parents raise their children and there is no compass given whatsoever to what their children should be doing in their lives as their great major purpose and function. But this is the biggie. Do we get this? This is the big one. And so it is a child is raised with what I'm supposed to be doing. What will I contribute in this world? And he gets to be 10 years old, he understands that. He gets to be 30, gets to, and he's understanding that and going with that. And he gets to be 80. And he gets to be 90-something years old like our brother Bob here. And here is Bob who's still saying, I know what I'm going to contribute to this world. Here I am. I'm, I'm going to be at assembly this morning if I can be there. And here's Bob as the light of the world. He understands a child should understand this too. 
mom and dad should have this firmly entrenched in their children's minds. And then there's this an another absolute that parents should, should be putting into their minds, the, the minds of their children, and that is the eternal nature of their children and the fact that they are going to be living somewhere eternally. Where, where will I live eternally? Because remember, we go back to the big picture. Remember that? The magnitude of it all. Designed by God, created by God, and we'll live forever. Many parents raise their children without any thought whatsoever about their children living forever. But the truth is, Jesus is going to return. Second Peter 3, these things will be dissolved. The coming of the day is going to come. All these things are going to be destroyed. The question is, what persons ought you to be in your holy conduct and godliness? And he answers the rhetorical question. You should be godly. This is what life is. You know, parents get so concerned about preparing their, their children for the second half of their lives. They want them to do good. They love their kids. We understand this. We all do this. But sometimes parents couldn't care less about where their children are going to live eternally. We should be putting these things into our children very young. And these things should be huge, very, very major in their lives so they can pinpoint these things and say, Dad, I know this is really a big one in my life. You've told me many times, you know. All of these principles should be in a young child going forward and well alive in the function of who they are. So there's this awesome construction pro project and, and so much more to say, but if we have these, these things going on, then we begin to create the focus in the right direction. But every parent has to have the right toolbox if he's going to make these things happen. And we begin with the very idea that a parent has to be converted himself. It's hard for non-serving parents to raise serving children. It's hard for selfish parents to raise giving selfless children. A central part of a parent toolbox is an, an inner true sincerity and genuineness before God. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then the second one hinges off that, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But it comes out of this one first. You love your God with all of that, all that you are. And that's what a parent starts with. And then a parent begins to put that into his child. But you know, if you don't really love God, if God's really not first in your life, if you're just kind of plugged in to the side in spirituality, and God is not your core, you just kind of lack the tools that you need for your child to have all this stuff operating within. You know what I mean? We would say this is critically important. Secondly, the parent toolbox has to have as a standard of operation the Word of God. And we can feed all of the, the human books and many, many good ones out there. We can feed all those human books, but if, they, if they're lacking the Word of God, they're lacking everything. And if a parent is lacking this in his own life, he's lacking everything. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God got to hear the way He wanted to, and it's powerful. It works. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That, what can happen from the Word of God? The man of God may be complete. How does a human being get completed from the Word of God? See, it's not human education. That's not completion. It's not by a variety of great experiences. Well, that's, that's not completion. What will complete a human being? What will complete a human being is the Scripture given by God 
that was designed by God in all of His wisdom for the mind of the human which He designed in all wisdom. God designed the human mind. God designed His Word. Guess what? He made them to integrate. And they work well together. If a parent, though, does not, it's not really concerned about Scripture, then he's not going to be concerned about the things of his child. And a parent must be, number one, concerned himself, but he must also be concerned of his child is taking these things of the Scripture because if this is what completes a person, he has to have this. He has to have it. Every parent in his toolbox has to have energy. That's a hard one. Parents are tired. You come home, you're tired. Leave me alone for a while. Dads get to say, moms don't get to say that, you know. <laughs> uh, but be diligent, Second Peter 2, to present yourself approved of God. And, and this is so true across the board. You just have to push yourself when you don't feel like it. You have to make priorities your true priorities. Put those true priorities as as those things that are going to live no matter what, and you just have to get energized. And the truth is, we usually get energized about those things we care about the most, right? We will do those things we care about the most. If we really care about our children the most, and our energy is going to be focused in the right way, a very focused energy, to do those things that will build not their physical abilities, but their spiritual abilities and their spiritual volume and their walk before God. And then lastly, in the parent toolbox, there should be the grasping of the flash of opportunity. Psalm 39, 4, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is nothing, as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best is but vapor. So we start thing, saying, Lord, teach me to recognize how short my life is. It, it's a handbreadth. Not very long, not very wide. Help me to measure my days so you get to live 20 to 25,000 days on earth. That's where most humans live. Not very long, is it? And it's over with. Opportunity of life is even gone quickly here, but wow, the opportunities that you have with their, your children are even smaller, are even shorter. If you have your child between zero and, and 18 years, 20 years, that's a short time period, right? You know what? It happens quickly. It really happens quickly. We ask the Dunhams, looking at graduating kids. How can this be? I share the crying dad syndrome. You know, I'm not ready for my kids to, to leave home yet. They're still my little kids. Moms do that too. The opportunities are lost. And these major opportunities of the first few years, when you can cement these, these things in a child's mind, they're quickly lost. You don't want to wait and teach, you know, some kid who's 12 or 14 about who he is, about what he's supposed to be doing. These are opportunities that should be taken when they're very, very young. You, you use the flash before the flash is gone. The opportunities of child rearing, they, they just happen so quickly. And pretty soon you're looking at being a grandparent. Hey, I wasn't going to be, ever be a grandparent, right? Because I'm perpetually a young man. <laughs> That's kind of how you think when you're young. I'm 20 years old. I can do anything I want to. And, well, old man is something very remote on another planet somewhere. But I'm not going to ever be an old man. Right, Wayne? Now look at Wayne. He's an old man. No, he's not quite there yet. But We understand this. We have to use our opportunities because they're quickly lost the fleeting nature of raising your children and the stages that are they're gone. It's not very long, you know, even from birth to three months, you've got a loss of a stage from three months to nine months. There's a 
There's a new stage, which is, means the old one's gone. And, and then a year and a two years old, and then four years old, and you see all these new stages that are, that are coming. It's a new stage, and, and the old ones, they're gone, and they'll never be there again. How, what'd you do with those stages? Did you use the flash that was before you? See, that, that's what we have to do. Every parent should know this. If you didn't know it before, use the flash of opportunity now because it's going to be gone. And many a parent has lamented when it was all over. I'm thinking of a parent right now who with tears in his eyes said, I was not committed during the years we were raising our children. And no wonder his children are not faithful. We have to use our opportunities. We have to grasp the flash of opportunity that's before us because it will be over very, very quickly. And all of those who have kids that are away from home now, we all say amen. But may we all say amen to know that this is true. Let's use what we have while we have it. Really, every parent needs to be aligning his child with everything that God meant for that child to be. That's the parent role. Satan messes this up. Satan makes it secular. Satan divorces God from it so that a parent thinks everything is having to do with prepping a, a, a child for this world, if they need any prep at all. But here's the greatest thing that you can do for your child. Align your child with everything that God meant for that child to be. And there is a child that will reach everything it's supposed to be at its full potential as it continues to give itself to God and, and to grow in these things. There's a child that will become something for God that will be a helper to the world, that will be a light in a dark nation, that will be teaching their children the way to go and trying to do the same thing that you were doing for your children. Here's our job. We need to realize the magnitude of what we're doing. Multiply your attitude toward your child times two, and you're not going to not gonna get it yet. Multiply by ten, you're not going to get it yet. This is a God thing of cosmic forces, greater than cosmic forces. We want to use what we have, the opportunity we have, to train this child to be a godly person, thinking of God, understand its identity, serve God so that you can be fairly certain, you know, the child will have to develop their own faith, but do what you can so that you know, you can, you can believe that when you're dead and gone, this child will still be serving God and they will someday approach their own death with a great hope that they're going to be with their Lord. Isn't that what you want in your child? This is the everything. Here's the beautiful thing. God did everything to make you his child. He even gave his son on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could, above cosmic proportions, come into the eternal with God himself. What a beautiful, awesome thing that is. God is calling you to his sonship today. He's calling you through his word. He's calling you to come and to believe in His Son, Jesus, and to confess, repent of your sins, to be baptized into Jesus, and to, and to have that hope of eternal life. God would like you to do this, and the reason is because He loves you. Remember that identity? God loves you. God is trying to bring you to Himself. It is what God designed you to be. Think about where you are. If you're ready to obey Jesus, there's water right here. You can use your faith and drive forward, do the will of God. Why not use, though, today this opportunity before you, this flash of opportunity that is before you at this moment, and obey the Lord. Do that now. Stand as we stand and as we stand.